Chapter 2. Solidarity, Not Charity Mainstream understanding of how to support people in crises relies on the frameworks of charity and social services. We should be very clear. Mutual aid is not charity. Charity, aid, relief, and social services are terms that usually refer to rich people or the government making decisions about the provision of some kind of support to poor people. That is, rich people or the government deciding who gets the help, what the limits are to that help, and what strings are attached. You can be sure that help like that is not designed to get to the root causes of poverty and violence. It is designed to help improve the image of the elites who are funding it and putting a tiny inadequate band-aid on the massive social wound that their greed creates. The charity model we live with today has origins in Christian European practices of the wealthy giving alms to the poor to buy their own way into heaven. It is based on a moral hierarchy of wealth. The idea that rich people are inherently better and more moral than poor people, which is why they deserve to be on top. Not surprisingly, the charity model promotes the idea that most poverty is a result of laziness or immorality, and that only the poor people who can prove their moral worth deserve help. Contemporary charity become, comes with eligibility requirements such as sobriety, piety, curfews, participation in job training or parenting courses, cooperation with the police, a lawful immigration status, or identifying the paternity of children. In charity programs, social workers, healthcare providers, teachers, clergy, lawyers, and government workers determine which poor people deserve help. Their methods of deciding who is deserving, and even the rules they enforce, usually promote racist and sexist tropes, such as the idea that poor women of color and immigrant women have too many children, or that black families are dysfunctional, or that indigenous children are better off separated from their families and communities, or that poor people are poor because of drug use. We can see examples in government policy, like the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families programs, or TANF, which impose family caps in 14 states. These laws restrict poor families from receiving additional benefits when they have a new child. For example, in Massachusetts, a single parent with two children receives a measly $578 in TANF benefits each month. But if a second child is born while the family is already receiving TANF, that child is ineligible and the family receives $100 less per month for a grant of $478. This policy emerges from the racist, sexist idea that poor women, especially women of color and immigrant women, should be discouraged from having children, and the faulty assumption that their poverty is somehow a result of being overly reproductive. We can also see harmful moralizing eligibility requirements when people have to prove they are sober or under psychiatric care to qualify for housing programs. Charity programs, both those run by the government and those run by nonprofits, are also set up in ways that make it stigmatizing and miserable to receive help. The humiliation and degradation of doing required work assignments to get benefits too small to live off of or answering endless personal questions that treat the recipient like a fraud and a crook are designed to make sure people will accept any work at any exploitative wage or condition to avoid relying on public benefits. Charity makes rich people and corporations look generous while upholding and legitimizing the systems that concentrate wealth. Charity is increasingly privatized and con contracted out to the massive nonprofit sector, which benefits rich people more than poor people in two big ways. First, elite donors get to run the show. They decide what gets funded and what doesn't. Nonprofits compete to show that they are the best organization to win a grant. To win, nonprofits want to make their work look legitimate to the funder, which means working according to the funder's beliefs about the causes causes of and solutions for a particular problem rather than challenging those beliefs. 
For example, the funder may favor nonprofits that make sobriety a condition of receiving a spot in a homeless shelter because rich people would rather believe that homelessness is caused by poor people's drug use rather than it is caused by a capitalist housing market. To win grants, nonprofits also seek to make themselves look successful and impactful regardless of whether their work is actually getting to the root cause of the problem. For example, social service nonprofits will often claim that they have worked with large numbers of people, even though most of those people didn't be, did not become less vulnerable or get what they needed from their contact with the nonprofit. Similarly, homelessness service groups sometimes claim that they reduced shelter use, but the people who stopped using the shelter are still unhoused and simply not using the shelter for various reasons. In this way, poverty-focused and homelessness-focused nonprofits are essentially encouraged to merely manage poor people, provide limited and conditional access to prison-like shelters, and make people take budgeting classes or provide their, prove their sobriety. They do not do the more threatening and effective work that grassroots mutual aid groups do for housing justice, like defending encampments against raids, providing immediate no-strings health care and food to poor and un unhoused people, fighting real estate developers, slumlords, and gentrification, or fighting for and providing access to long-term housing. Rich people's control of nonprofit funding keeps nonprofits from doing work that is threatening to the status quo or from admitting the limits of their strategies. In worst case scenarios, nonprofits are integrated into programs that make vulnerable people even more vulnerable. An example of this is the Homeless Management Information System, a federal computerized information management tool that requires homeless services and charities to record the names and information of their clients in order to receive federal aid, putting criminalized and undocumented people at further risk. Second, the nonprofit system creates a tax shelter for rich people. They can put a bunch of their money in a charitable foundation, allowing them to avoid paying taxes on it and instead getting to direct it to their favorite pet projects. Most foundation money goes to things the board members and executive directors, who in the case of US foundations are over 90% white, value such as their alma maters, the opera and museums. Foundations are not even required to give much of their wealth away. They give out only 5% a year and still reap the benefits of a tax haven for their money and the social cachet of being a philanthropist. And that 5% can also be used to pay their friends and family hundreds of thousands of dollars per year to be trustees of their foundation. The creation of the nonprofit sector, sector that has ballooned in the last half century was a direct response to the threat posed by mass mutual aid work in the anti-racist, anti-colonial and feminist movements of the 1960s and 70s. Nonprofitization was designed to demobilize us legitimizing unjust systems and hiding the reality that real change comes from movements made of millions of ordinary people, not small groups of paid professionals. These days, the nonprofits that purport to address poverty are mostly run by white elites. The idea promoted by nonprofits and universities is that people with advanced degrees are best suited to figure out the solutions to social pro problems. It mystifies the causes of poverty, making it seem like some kind of mysterious math problem that only people with advanced degrees can figure out. But any poor person knows that poverty is caused by the greed of their bosses, landlords, and health insurance companies, by systems of white supremacy and colonialism, and by wars and forced migrations. Elite solutions to poverty are always about managing poor people and never about redistributing wealth. The nonprofit sector not only fails to fix injustice, but also replicates it with the, within the groups themselves. Nonprofits are usually run like businesses, with the boss, executive director, at the top deciding things for the people underneath. Nonprofits have the same kinds of problems as other businesses that rely on hierarchical models. Drastically unequal pay, race and gender wage gaps, 
sexual harassment in the workplace, exploitation of workers, and burnout. Despite the fact that they pitch themselves as the solution for fixing the problems of the current system, nonprofits mostly replicate, legitimize, and stabilize that system. One way the charity model is manifested is in the idea of having a cause. Celebrities and philanthropists show us that picking an issue to care about and giving or raising money for it is part of their brand in a similar vein as their fashion choices. This idea of a charitable cause that is disconnected from other aspects of life keeps us in our places. We are encouraged to be mostly numbed out consumers, but ones who perhaps volunteer at a soup kitchen on Thanksgiving, post videos about animal rights on our social media accounts, or wear a t-shirt with a feminist slogan now and again. Only those few experts or specialists who work in nonprofits are supposed to make concern for justice a large part of their lives by turning it into a career. But even they are supposed to still be obedient consumers. The false separation of politics and injustice from ordinary life, and the idea that activism is a kind of lifestyle accessory, is demobilizing to our movements, hides the root causes of injustice, and keeps us passive and complicit. Robust social movements offer an opposing view. We argue that all the aspects of our lives, where and how we live and work, eat, entertain ourselves, get around and get by are sites of injustice and potential resistance. At our best, social movements create vibrant social networks in which we not only do work in a group, but also have friendships, make art, have sex, mentor and parent kids, feed ourselves and each other, build radical land and housing experiments, and inspire each other about how we can cultivate liberation in all aspects of our lives. Activism and mutual aid shouldn't feel like volunteering or like a hobby. It should feel like living in alignment with our hopes for the world and with our passions. It should enli enliven us. The charity model encourages us to feel good about ourselves by giving back. Convincing us that we have done enough if we do a little volunteering or posting online is a great way to keep us in our place. Keeping people numb to the suffering in the world and their own suffering is essential to keeping things as they are. In fact, things are really terrifying and enraging right now and feeling more rage, fear, sadness, grief, and despair may be appropriate. Those feelings may help us be less appeased by false solutions and stir us to pursue ongoing collective action for change. That doesn't mean that mutual aid work never feels good. In fact, it is often deeply satisfying and connective, creating caring relationships, raucous celebrations, and an enduring sense of purpose. In my experience, it is more engagement that actually enlivens us more curiosity, more willingness to see the harm that surround, surrounds us, and ask how we can relate to it differently. Being more engaged with the complex and painful realities we face, and with thoughtful, committed action alongside others for justice, feels much better than numbing out or making token, self-consoling charity gestures. It feels good to let our values guide every part of our lives. Mutual aid projects, in many ways, are defined in opposition to the charity model and its current iteration in the nonprofit sector. Mutual aid projects mobilize lots of people rather than a few experts, resist the use of eligibility criteria that cut out more stigmatized people, are an integrated part of our lives rather than a pet cause, and cultivate a shared analysis of the root causes of the problem and connect people to social movements that can address these causes. Part two of this book focuses on how we can build our mutual aid groups in ways that can most successfully accomplish these goals, avoiding the pitfalls of the charity model and the learned hierarchical behaviors that can reproduce injustice, even in activist group settings. 
What we build now and whether we can sustain it will determine how prepared we are for the next pandemic, the climate-induced disasters to come, the ongoing disasters of white supremacy and capitalism, and the beautifully disruptive rebellions that will transform them.